Hello everyone, welcome back to the continuation of pediatric dentistry question papers discussion and we are into the fifth part of uh, many sessions and today's session is dealing with orthodontics that is pediatric orthodontics and first question uh, regarding the classification of oral habits then it is uh, uh, explaining the deleterious effects of mouth breathing and diagnostic tools and management okay so uh, this question doesn't uh, include the definition of habits it is starting with classification but definition as you all know Walsh defined habit as a tendency toward an act or an act that has become a repeated performance relatively fixed consistent easy to perform and almost automatic so that is a definition of habit so classification uh, we have many classification that is uh, James uh, as uh, one as useful and harmful habits useful habits means uh, they are for the normal function such as correcting the tongue position and the glutination and harmful habits uh, which is acting against the teeth and then the larches like mouth breathing and tongue thrusting and we have another classification given by Finn compulsive and non-compulsive compulsive occurred as a fixation in the child to the extent that he retreats to the practice whenever his security is threatened Whereas non-compulsive is uh, they uh, undergo continuing behavior modification which permit them to release certain undesirable habit pattern and form new ones which are socially accepted. Okay, compulsive is based on the security threatening and this is uh, which is socially accepted ones. And primary habits are normal habits whereas the secondary habits uh, due to the supplemental problem like large tongue uh, which causes a tongue thrusting habit meaningful and uh, empty habits meaningful are uh, with a deep rooted psychological problem empty are meaningless that can be treated easily by a dentist using a reminder therapy and we have another classification normal and abnormal normal are mm, normal uh, according to the age group abnormal are habits which pursued after their physiological period of cessation uh, for example uh, if the child child is having a persistent uh, thumb sucking uh, even after three three and a half years it is called abnormal habits until that period it is normal now we have physiologic and pathologic Physiological are uh, normal which is required for normal functioning that is nasal respiration uh, sucking during infancy whereas pathological uh, due to the pathological reasons such as adenoids and nasal septal defects that may lead to mouth breathing retained and cultivated habits are uh, retained are carried over from childhood into adulthood cultivated those cultivated during the socio-active life of an individual so what are the deleterious effect of mouth breathing so we know mouth breathing which can cause adenoid faces that is a long face uh, lips will be held apart there will be short upper lip uh, chin is receded and typical pigeon face uh, nose is tipped superiorly the bridge of nose will be flat and long narrow face all are the problems of mouth breathing so how do we diagnose mouth breathing there are many tests many uh, uh, diagnostic methods the first one is observing the patient so these mouth breathers the lips will be apart whereas the nasal breathers lips will be always stretching because they are breathing through the nasal but in mouth breathers they have to open the mouth so lips will be apart and asking the patient to take a deep breath through nose mouth breathers there will not be any change in shape or size of external nares that is there will be remains same during the in inhalation and uh, exhalation whereas nasal breathers they demonstrate good control of alarm muscles so mouth breathers 
there is no change in shape or size of external iris because they are breathing through the mouth. But nasal breathers, there will be change in the uh, LR muscles. That size might, uh, it will change because of the uh, flow of air through the nasal cavity. Next one is a mirror test. It is also called as fog test. So we need to take a two surface mirror on the patient's upper lip. So if the air condenses on the upper side of the mirror, so the mirror is two sided. Okay. So if the air condenses on the upper side, the patient is a nasal breather. But if it does on the opposite side, that is on the lower side, is a mouth breather because air is passing through the lower side. Now we have the water holding test. That is, patient is asked to hold the mouth. Uh, full of water, mouth breathers cannot retain the water for a long time because their breathing is interrupted. Now we have the butterfly test. We need to take a few fibers of cotton and place it just below the nasal opening. So what happens is on exhalation, if the fibers of the cotton flutter downwards, the patient is a nasal breather. But if fibers flutter upward, is a mouth breather. Now we have the rhinometry. That is the total airflow through the nose and mouth can be quantified using this plethysmography and we can uh, make out which kind of uh, respiration is a person is having. And the last technique is cephalometrics. Uh, we can calculate the amount of nasopharyngeal space using the cephalometric analysis. So what would be the treatment for this? So the main aspect of management of a mouth breathing patient is to treat and eliminate the underlying cause or pathology which created the habit and after that symptomatic treatment. So other procedures and appliances that can be uh, used are deep breathing exercise, lip exercise and oral screen. See if it is uh, due to the adenoids that has to be corrected or if any other problems, the cause which is creating this habit should be corrected. Otherwise, the symptom, if we are doing just symptomatic treatment, there will be continuous problem, there will be relapse. Now we have the question of space maintenance. So classify space maintenance, then discuss the sequelae of premature loss of deciduous teeth and describe the management of a five-year-old child. This is a very commonly asked question. The year five-year-old might become six-year-old, seven-year-old, eight-year-old, just to confuse you. So always expect a question like this. Five-year-old child who requires extraction of mandibular right second deciduous molar. Okay, so you need to be very uh, cautious while writing the answer. It can be a first deciduous molar, second deciduous molar, so the scenario is different so you need to be very cautious because uh, it may easily get changed mandibular right and second first and second deciduous molar you need to read the question very properly and write so classification of space maintenance so uh, hitchcock classified it as removal of fixed uh, or semi-fixed with an without bands, functional and non-functional, active or passive, and combination. Raymond's classified removable, complete individual tooth. Hendrickson classified it as fixed spaced and removable space. In fixed space, class 1, class 2, where non-functional functional in class 1, can deliver in class 2. Now, just let's learn the sequelae of a maxillary deciduous first molar. So, what happens when the maxillary deciduous first molar is absent? So, this question uh, will be there. Uh, it can be maxillary deciduous first molar or uh, maxillary deciduous second molar or even uh, mandibular. Uh, questions will be there regarding the first and second deciduous molar. So while writing, you need to be very careful because uh, you might end up writing the wrong answer. So what happens when maxillary deciduous first molar is lost? So this deciduous cuspid, okay, shifts distally. 
in the first year only if at all if it is shifting and the first permanent molar and second deciduous molar shift majorly okay with the amount depending on the duration of absence and age at loss at what age the tooth is uh, uh, getting lost or what is the duration of absence so depending upon that first permanent molar and second deciduous molar okay so that will shift majorly but whereas a cuspid it shift distally and an erupting first bicuspid that is a premolar is guided along the mesial surface of mesially migrating second deciduous molar and it eventually lying close to the lateral incisor so this is what happens when maxillary deciduous first molar is lost whereas maxillary deciduous second molar is lost what happens is second bicuspid is generally impacted and permanent molar shift mesially the cuspid and first deciduous molar shift distally as the first bicuspid generally have an eruption timing advantage over the second bicuspid it will erupt earlier into the site maintained by the first deciduous molar because that is a successor and often with a distal drift so the resultant lack of space between the permanent molar and first bicuspid causes impaction of second bicuspid so you need to visualize this when i am talking so it is uh, not very confusing so what happens is the first thing is the second bicuspid will be impacted permanent molar shift to mesial side i mean towards mesially and uh, canine and first deciduous molar shift distally and uh, this uh, distal drift will be there by the first deciduous molar next we have the sequelae of loss of mandibular deciduous molar so the effect of mandibular extraction tend to be similar for all three situations that is loss of primary first molar second molar or both unlike the maxillary so timing differentials between the canine first premolar and second premolar and the mandible appears to account most of the similarity among groups so in case of loss of first primary mandibular molar the permanent first molar and deciduous second molar tips forward and in case of loss of second primary mandibular molars the permanent molar tip forward in case of loss of first and second primary mandibular molars the permanent molar will tip forward and primary canine will tip distally leading to impaction of bicuspids and it will result in midline shift now we are into the space maintainer categories the first one is the distal shoe space maintainer it is very commonly asked question when how where this space maintainer is kept from this picture it is very easy there will be a stainless steel crown from the distal side there will be a bar which is uh, pointing towards the mesial side of erupting permanent first molar and it will guide the eruption pathway so what are the indications when the second deciduous molar is lost prior to the eruption of first permanent molar okay so that time we need to keep this distal shoe space maintainer we need to maintain the space for first permanent molar okay so what are the indications of distal shoe space maintainer as i mentioned when the perm, uh, deciduous second molar that is e are lost prior to the eruption of first permanent molar see permanent molar will be erupting distal to the second deciduous molar that is distal to e this e will be replaced by the premolars okay this d and e will be replaced by the premolars so what happens is this e supposed to be exfoliated by the age of uh, 10 11 but it is uh, extracted due to many reasons it could be caries or any other reason it is lost before the eruption of first permanent molar that is before the age of 6 or 7 years because that age 
uh, where the permanent first molar erupts. So if it uh, extracted at the age of five, what happens is this molar will come to the space of this molar will come to the space of E. Okay. So what happens is when this premolar comes to the space, it will get impacted. There will not be any space for this premolars. Okay. So this space has to be maintained for the eruption of premolars because this D and E will be replaced by first premolar and second premolar and this molar should be at this level. If this space is not maintained, what happens is this molar will eventually will be here and there will not be any space for premolars. So that is how distal surface of second primary molar provides a guide for unerupted first permanent molar. So when the second primary molar, this one is not here, removed prior to the eruption of first permanent molar, the intraalveolar appearance provides greater control of path of eruption of the unerupted tooth and prevents undesirable mesial migration. So this will not go to mesial side if it is kept here. So it will act as a guiding plane. That is a distal shoe space maintainer. You need to understand the concept. So design uh, using first primary molar as a burden. This is the first primary molar. The second primary molar is missing. So there will be a steel band is adapted. And from this steel band, there will be a horizontal bar and an intraalveolar extension, which is uh, directing towards the mesial side of this erupting permanent first molar. Okay, so this is how it is created to this prepared for stainless steel crown and on the band it is fitted and impression is made, band is removed and placed impression and the sound model is prepared and all those things, the usual uh, preparation steps. So indication I told unilateral loss of primary first molar before the eruption of first uh, permanent molar and unilateral loss of first or second primary molar after the eruption of uh, first permanent molar or bilateral loss of first primary molar before the eruption of permanent incisors and first permanent molar or bilateral loss of second primary molar after the eruption of first permanent molar. So in any scenario we can use this. But contraindication and occlusion that is extremely crowded or already exhibits marked space loss. High dental caries activity. Replacement of primary anterior teeth or replacement of primary second molar in transitional dentition with permanent molar not erupted. We cannot use this. So I already explained this. This is a wire and band loop. This is a crib. Crib is a portion of the wire spanning edangular space. This is the edangular space and crib is a wire spanning through the edangular space. And there is a loop portion of the wire contacting the abutment tooth. This is where the contacting uh, abutment tooth and band which encircles the abutment. Now define and classify space maintainer. Describe about fixed space maintainer for bilateral loss of deciduous molars. So according to Bausch, it is fixed to removable appliances designed to preserve the space created by the premature loss of primary tooth or a group of teeth. Okay, so classification we have learned earlier. So bilateral loss we have uh, on the lower teeth that is lingual arch space maintainer. This is a lingual arch space maintainer where it is uh, taken uh, uh, abutment from both molars and there is a band, there is a wire arch which is uh, running from one molar to the another molar through the lingual side of remaining teeth so it is a bilateral non-functional it could be passive or active mandibular fixed appliance it is fixed and it is the most effective appliance for space maintenance and minor tooth movements in the lower arch and the design so this arch wire this is the arch wire <clears throat> this arch wire should contact the erupted permanent incisor. This is a permanent incisor. It should contact permanent incisors at the cingulum. So this is a cingulum part. 
and r square should be located 2 mm below the gingival margin then uh, or edentulous region the posterior region to prevent distortion and a process of mastication and should be located 1 to 2 mm lingual to the posterior teeth permitting satisfactory eruption of the bicuspid here should not interfere with the premolar eruption and the arch wire should meet the band at mesio buccal cusp and at the same time place uh, the soldered joint in the middle third of the band to avoid occlusal interference it should not come to the incisal or occlusal side it should be at the middle third of the band to avoid occlusal interference so there are modifications for this lingular space pointer that is hot lingularch with a u loop for space regaining and removable one and omega bends in canine region to prevent in interference and the one which is applied in the maxillary uh, arch is a nans palatal arch it is again bilateral non-functional passive uh, fixed appliance that does not contact the anterior teeth okay it is coming in contact with the palate unlike the mandibular nans uh, sorry the lingual arch space minor it is contacting the permanent anterior teeth where it is not contacting Instead of that, uh, it has an anterior palate uh, acrylic button that contacts the palatal tissue. This is an acrylic button which provides a resistance to the anterior movement of posterior teeth in a horizontal direction. Okay. So the arch wire extends anteriorly without touching against the surface of primary molars. See, arch wire is going like this without touching. Primary molars as a successor bicuspid usually are broader buccolingually. Okay, it should not come here, it should not go like this because it will interrupt this premolar eruption and the wire could deflect them if it is kept here. So, at the rogue area, small U shaped bend uh, is incorporated, which is approximately 1 to 2 mm away from the soft tissue, and the bend will enhance the retention. And this acrylic button is 0.5 inch in diameter is placed usually on the descending portion of the palatal wall 1 to 2 mm below the incisive papilla. This is the incisive papilla. Now we have next question that is interceptive orthodontics and enlist various interceptive orthodontic problems in children. Discuss the management of an 8 year old boy with retained maxillary primary central incisor and lingual eruption of permanent central incisor so that's what i was saying this year eight year old boy six year old girl that question will be there so make sure the concepts are very clear so the interceptive orthodontics american association of orthodontists defined it as a phase of science and art of orthodontics employed to recognize and eliminate the potential irregularities and malpositions the developing dento facial complex so we have many uh, procedures like serial extraction, space regaining, correction of uh, crossbite, oral habit, elimination, muscle exercise, interception of developing skeletal malocclusion, removal of soft tissue or bony barrier. So next question is define oral habits. Discuss the clinical feature and management of thumb sucking. Okay, habits I already mentioned the definition. Thumb sucking, the clinical features, digits appears reddened, exceptionally clear, chapped and a short fingernail that is clean dishpan thumb and lips will be the position at a rest or during swallowing should be observed. There will be a short hypotonic upper lip, lower lip will be hyperactive and this leads to proclination of upper anterior teeth, convex profile will be having for the child and higher incidence of middle ear infection, enlarged tonsils. So regarding the intraoral examination, the type of malocclusion produced by digital sucking uh, is dependent uh, on a number of variables like position of the digit, associated orofacial muscle contractions, mandibular positions during sucking, facial skeletal pattern, frequency, duration and intensity of habit. So how do we manage it? Firstly, feed the child whenever uh, he or she is hungry. Secondly, feed the child in a natural way. 
importance of breastfeeding is primarily psychological and secondarily nutritive. Thirdly, never let the habit to be started. The practice must be discontinued at its inception. And use of a dummy or pacifier, encouraging the baby to suck a dummy instead of his thumb. In psychological therapy, nagging, scolding or frightening the child should be avoided since this could cause negativism. Beta hypothesis or Dunlop's hypothesis says that if a subject can be forced to concentrate on the performance of an act at the time he practices it, he could learn to stop performing the act. Forced purposeful repetition of a habit eventually associates with unpleasant reactions and the habit is abandoned. So this child should be asked to sit in front of a mirror and asked to observe himself as he indulges in habit. In chemical treatment, bitter and sour chemicals can be applied uh, like um, quinine, pepper, casserole, asafetida, all these things can be applied. But it is found to be very uh, not very useful. And in mechanical therapy or remainder therapy like splints, adhesive tapes, uh, oral screen, quarrelix, removable or fixed palatal grip, thumb guard, all can be used. And regarding the current strategies, there are thumb home concept, use of hand puppets, increasing the arm length of uh, night suit, all can be used. Now we have a question that is space maintainers discuss the management of an eight year old girl with untreatable bilateral mandibular primary molar. So all exp explained previously you can use a lingual arch appliance. Mouth breathing is already explained. Classification is obstructive, habitual and anatomical. Now we have a cross bed and it's a uh, explanation about uh, inclined plane that is Catalan's plane. According to Graeber, crossbite is a condition where one or more teeth may be abnormally malposed buccally or lingually or clearly with reference to the opposing teeth. It's very simple crossbite you know. So what are the types of crossbite? Dental alveolar. This is often manifested as a single tooth crossbite and usually occurs due to the over retained deciduous teeth. Whereas functional one the presence of occlusal prematurities, which deflects the mandible into a more forward path of closure. So this type crossbite results from the functional shift of mandible. It's commonly seen in pseudoglass 3. And it can be easily treated by eliminating this occlusal premature. It is a functional one. But a skeletal anterior crossbite, where it is due to the skeletal discrepancy of maxilla or mandible. So whole segment is affected instead of one or two teeth. So it can be because of maxillary retrognathism or mandibular prognathism. Okay, this type of crossbite is best intercepted by the growth modification using myofunctional or orthopedic appliances. So it, it is indicated used uh, only in those cases where the crossbite is due to palately placed maxillary incisor. So it is constructed at 45 degree anchoration on the lower anterior teeth by acrylic or cast metal. Now we have uh, preventive orthodontics and discuss the various methods of serial extraction. So Graeber defined as action taken to preserve the integrity of what appears to be normal occlusion at a specified time or it is the prevention of potential interference with occlusal development. So serial extraction it is uh, initiated in the early mixed condition. And it is a process of extracting certain deciduous teeth and later specific permanent teeth in an orderly sequence and a predetermined pattern to guide the erupting permanent teeth into a more favorable position. Okay, so we are guiding the teeth in a favorable position by creating a sequence of extraction of teeth. So it is done in cases which show signs of persistent irregularities of teeth due to the insufficient space in the arch. Okay, so there are most commonly three methods. This uh, Duels method, Tweets and Nans method. Duels is uh, CD4, first is uh, deciduous canine, then the deciduous first molar, after that first premolar. This is almost same, Tweets and Nans. That is first molar. Then comes first premolar, after that canine. 
so definition we already seen the indications uh, and procedures indications we know premature loss of deciduous teeth arch length deficiency absence of physiological spacing lingual eruption of lateral incisor mesial drift of buccal segment gingival recession abnormal or asymmetric primary canine root resorption crowded maxillary mandibular incisor so ultimately if there is a uh, lack of space or there is a uh, discrepancy in size and tooth so all uh, these can be indications for serial extraction so tweets method we already discussed extraction of deciduous first molar by eight year then the first premolar followed by deciduous canine dual cis first deciduous canine then deciduous first molar after an year followed by extraction of first premolar so how do we uh, manage the anterior crossbite so if there is adequate space for the tooth in crossbite to be moved into its correct position tooth can be guided with the help of a tongue blade so it should be used an hour or two uh, per day for 10 to 14 days it is sufficient to deflect the lingually erupting tooth into a proper relationship and it can also be intercepted by using a catalan suppliance and double cantilever spring with posterior removable appliance now what is lip bumper as you see here you can see a lip bumper here lip bumper uh, or lip lumbar is a combined removable fixed appliance it is modified vestibular screen that is used for muscular force application or for elimination it can be used in both maxilla and mandible to shield the lips so it is preventing the lips action on the teeth and uh, these gum structures so it is made up of thick stainless stainless steel wire extending from one molar to this molar and wire made uh, is live uh, away from anterior teeth lip bumper is inserted into the round molar tubes so you can see these tubes an anterior portion of the wire from canine to canine so lip bumper used in maxillary arch is known as then holds appliance so it is used in patients exhibiting lower lip habits such as lip sucking and in patients exhibiting hyperactive mentalis uh, muscle activity that is causes flattening or crowding of the lower anteriors distalization of first molar so what are space regain is it regain the space that is Gerber space regainer and cantilever spring Gerber space regainer is an orthodontic band or a crown selected for the tooth to be distalized so this space regainer consists of u-shaped hollow tubing and a u-shaped rod that enters the tubing the tube is soldered or welded on the mesial aspect of a smaller to be moved distally whereas cantilever spring molar can be distalized to regain space by using removable appliances that incorporate simple finger springs and anterior space regainer it is like standard label tubes are bounded and an open coil spring pass through the central incisor tube and also king's appliance that is the edgewise bracket is sport welded to the buccal surface you can see this one buccal surface of the primary molar band and the completed anchorage unit is cemented okay a band with an Anculated buccal tube is cemented on the malpostian molar and a straight section of wire with an open coil spring is introduced into the buccal tube and ligated into the bracket. So to its analysis that is part of cephalometric analysis we have stainless analysis and downs analysis. Uh, mostly expect this tweets analysis because it is a simple one downs and uh, other one is a little complicated tweets uh, we have triangulation that is FMA ankle, IMP ankle and FMA ankle all, all together it constitute of a triangle that is 180 degree so FMA ankle is mandibular plane angle 25 IMP is 90 that is lower incisor ankle FMA is angle between Frankfurt horizontal plane and lower incisor plane that is 65 degree okay so that is all about the orthodontic part of uh, pedodontic uh, questions uh, so we will come with the uh, sixth session that is uh, we have cardiology and other things so hope you understood this uh, it's the most confusing one is the distal shoe and 
the band and loop, lingual arch and other things. So I'll come up with the sixth part in my next session. Thank you.